front lines. Men on the front lines. Men on the front lines. Men on the front lines. We call for these mighty men of valor. The Lord put a vision in my heart for a new movement amongst men in the body of Christ. The Lord says that I'm going to make champions out of those who would gather unto me. And I believe what men on the front lines will do. And I see it going into the nations. He's going to raise the bar among men. It's time for heroes to arise. I'm Robert Hodgkin, and this is Heroes Arise, Men on the Front Lines social media broadcast, equipping, encouraging, and empowering you to arise as the hero, warrior, and champion that God created you to be. You matter, you are important, and you've got a key role to play for the kingdom and the earth, so thank you for joining me again this week so we can continue to pour into you. We're going to talk about something very important this week. We're going to talk about the critical hour that we're in. Many would say things have gotten too dark in the earth, that there's deep darkness on the people and it's just too far gone. But I'm here to tell you, that's not true, that's not Bible, and you're gonna find out today from our very special guest that you, like we say every week, have a key role to play because things are about to get glorious. I wanna jump right in, no announcements this week, and introduce you to my very special guest, Dr. Cheon. Robert, it's an honor to be with you. Dr. Che, thank you for being here. You are one of my heroes of the faith. Well, thank um, you. Uh, my wife and I are actually part of the HIM network. We are grateful for not only your spiritual covering, but your incredible wisdom, your bravery, and just as much that everything you do for the kingdom, you do with fire, with zeal, with focus, but you also do in the character and nature of God. Well, you know, I give him all the glory. It's the grace of God we are what we are, right? And uh, when I think 49 years ago, I was a high school dropout, a drug addict, and so messed up with uh, LSD that fried my brains. Uh, but my parents, thank God for their prayers, and they love Jesus, and they went home to be with the Lord now, but uh, they prayed me into the kingdom. So really, I'm here by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. Well, we talk a lot about on the show about taking stands for righteousness, but always doing it in the character and nature of the righteous one. Right. And not only shifting the conversation, shifting the atmosphere, but doing a lot of that by continuing to walk in love and honor and respect. Absolutely. And you know, I, I don't actually want to go too deep down this road, but I really want to thank you for the stand you took in California because it was very important, the stand you took, but I also love the way that you did it. You didn't get into dishonor, disrespect. You truly operated as a Meshach, Shadrach, Daniel, Abednego, and you stood for righteousness, but you did it with love and honor. Well, you know, there's a key verse for in my life, 1 John 4, 17, as he was in the world, so are we in the world. So as Jesus was, we are to be. In other words, we're to be Christ-like in everything we do. And so it's interesting, I was just talking to uh, someone about predestination, and they asked me if I was a Calvinist, so if I believe some were predestined to be saved or damned. And I said, no, I, I don't take predestination that way. I talk about Romans 8, 29, that we've been predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so he's committed to helping us become Christ-like. And so we have to do that. Otherwise, we lose our witness. And people, unfortunately, have not been a Christ-like witness for the Lord, and we've had to gain ground to make up for the lost time and lost witness yeah. uh, throughout church history. Well, I think we're in a moment in church history or in a moment in global history where it's never been more important that Absolutely. we be Christ-like, right. that we let the kingdom arise in us, that we let his glory appear upon us, and we operate in his wisdom, we operate in his heart. Because as we talked about in the introduction, we're in some very dark and difficult days. And there are some that say it's too far gone, the USA is doomed. But you are actually carrying a message, a prophetic message, an apostolic mandate that we talk a lot about on the show quite a bit, that it's not too far gone. There's no. actually, in these historic epic days, there's incredible opportunity. I want you to stoke the fires of okay. hope and faith in the audience today. Well, I shared my first chapter. It's always the darkest time before the light of revival breaks out in space on Isaiah 60. You quoted from it, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Yeah. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth, deep darkness. 
but the Lord will rise upon you, glory will appear before you. And then it says this, nations will come to your light right. and kings to the brightness of your dawning. So we know Jesus is the light of the world and uh, the glory is his presence, his manifest presence. But we also know that we are to be like him, again, being Christ-like and people will be attracted to our light. And so it's really important to realize that there's always going to be darkness. The Bible says even till the last day there will be sheep nations, and goat nations. So we know uh, some people have a eschatology that we're going to save everyone, um, you know, before Jesus Christ comes back. No, uh, we're going to see tremendous harvest comes in, come in because Jesus said in Matthew 13, the harvest is at the end of the age, but there'll still be people who are lost. Why would you have the great day of judgment? If, and why would he separate sheep nations from goat nations if that was not the case? So we know there's going to be a parallel track of darkness and it's getting darker. I mean, just in California, we have this bill that's now pending in Sacramento called AB 2223, and it's legalizing infanticide. A woman who decides to have a baby, but within 30 days she decides mm. that she made a mistake and killed that child. Mm. This is crazy. This it's is child madness. sacrifice. It is child sacrifice, mm -hmm. literally. And of course, I believe that uh, the baby, of course, is a human in the womb. But, Absolutely. But now, even for those who just would never think of like this. They're buying into this narrative of evil, and the Democrats have passed it uniformly. Now it's up to uh, the the few minority of uh, Republicans to fight this, and that's where it's at right now. Mm. But it's so egregious. It I never thought that we would have a bill like this. Mm -mm. No, and I think part of the reason that it goes on, even with the the church as the dominion stewards in the earth, which right. has been God's plan since day six. Right. But I think the enemy is lying to us. Right. I think the enemy is broadcasting on all spiritual frequencies. It is too dark. It is too far gone. You're just too small. And I think too many Christians are seeing themselves as grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants instead of seeing how big our God is. Amen. How can we help shift that perspective in the church so we wake back up to the authority we have in Christ right. to do something about this? Well, I, again, we go back to Scripture because we're talking about Haggai 2, verse 7. I'm going to shake all nations. But then he says, I will fill this house with glory. Mm -hmm that glory is coming. And then to make it clearer, he says the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former in verse 9. So in other words, in a time of global shaking darkness, God's going to bring revival. And we see that. We saw that in World War II. It was tremendous darkness. 80 million people died, most of them civilian. Mm -hmm. And then right afterwards, we saw a tremendous revival with the latter rain revival of 48, Hebrides revival of 48, the Voice of Healing revival in 47, Billy Graham in 49, and then we go into the Charismatic Renewal, the Jesus People Movement, to Toronto outpouring, Brownsville revival. We're talking about 50 years, Jubilee uh, period of extraordinary revival. Now we're in darkness again mm -hmm. with this COVID-19. It's not just the COVID. Right. It's like the perfect storm. We've had George Floyd's murder, the racial unrest in Seattle and Portland, Oregon, Minneapolis. We're talking about election that was the most controversial in the history, 2020. Many people feel it was stolen. And then you have a war in Ukraine. It's just, a, we're talking about runaway prices, inflation. I mean, we, we're talking about in California, $7 a gallon for premium gas. Mm. It's so unbelievable. And so here we're seeing a perfect storm in the midst of this darkness and shaking. God says, I'm going to bring the greatest revival. Because C.S. Lewis said this in his book, The Problem of Pain. He whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. What does that mean? Mm. When things are going well, who needs God? But when we're suffering, we begin to turn to God and say, God, if you're out there, just reveal yourself mm. because I'm hopeless. I don't wow. have the answer. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I could keep this restaurant going. I don't know how I could pay rent. And when you're like that, all of a sudden, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. If you're sincere and you're crying out to God, He's going to reveal Himself to you and He will give the gift of faith. By grace you're saved through faith, not that of yourself. It's a gift of God. A lot of times we try to muster up and, right. you know, name it and claim it and confess, but it's a grace. When I had faith to sue the governor, it was a supernatural grace. 
That's why I give him all the glory. I don't take any credit for it because I know that he gave me the grace for the assignment and that's the way Christianity should be. The just shall live by faith. Amen. But the faith is a grace that comes from God. It's called the gift of faith in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When you talked about the faith and the grace, I could feel it. So I'm going to ask you to look into your camera and actually release that substance of faith and that substance of grace that you receive for your mandate to our audience. Absolutely. You know, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. All those are gifts from the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, you can't be righteous. We are declared righteous because of what Jesus Christ has done, but it's a gift. And, and peace is something that he gives to us. My peace I give to you, not as a world gift do I give to you. Joy, it's a gift. Again, he gives us joy overflowing, and so is faith. Everything from, from the Father is a gift, is a grace. And so I pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon you because it's in the Holy Spirit that the presence of God will envelop you. And whatever you're contending for, maybe it's for a healing in your body. I want to pray right now that he'll give you supernatural faith for that healing. It's not mustering it up and praying more and fasting more, although that could lead to this encounter of faith. But I want to just encourage you just right now, just receive this gift from Abba, Daddy. He loves you with an everlasting love. Just receive this faith and be healed now in Jesus' mighty name. Whatever your problem is, and contact Robert and let him know how you got healed. Amen, yeah. You know, in your book, Turning Our Nation Back to God Through Historic Revival, you looked at different revivals. And I want to ask, again, just to keep stoking that faith and that hope, what common denominators did you see in how the church participated with God? Now, God's sovereign. God can snap his fingers sure. and do it all. But as we've talked about, since day six, his plan has been to have a people in relationship with him who operate as dominion stewards in the earth. What did you see that believers believed for or were doing to help be that landing place for the great move? Well, of God? The, the three things that you see that's uniform from scripture to throughout revival would be extraordinary prayer. Okay. Uh, unity of the body and radical obedience. Mm. So we see in Acts 1 verse 14 where the church met in one accord in the upper room. And it says the apostles were there, there were 120, uh, with Mary and Jesus' brothers, which is interesting because mm. in John 7 says that his brothers didn't even believe in him. But after the resurrection, James, uh, Jew, they became followers of, of Jesus as their Messiah. But uh, that word, one accord, is really important. It's the Greek word homothumadon, and appears 10 times in the first 10 chapter of the book of Acts. And we see it over and over again, how they were of one accord. We see that in Acts 2, verse 1. We see it in Acts 4, when they're being persecuted, they say, Lord, take note of our threat. They cried out to the Lord in one accord, and they got filled again with the Holy Spirit. So unity of one accord is really, really important. And it doesn't mean that you agree with everything, but it's just being like-minded, uh, you love one another, you believe the best of one another, and that you're going after the same thing together. You have the same kingdom values and you're hungering together. But then extraordinary prayer. Mm -hmm. You have to realize when Jesus ascended, he told them to wait until they're endued with power from on high. He didn't tell them how long that was going to be. Right, now, right. we look back in retrospect in history, it was 10 days after the ascension to the day of Pentecost, but they, they didn't know. It could have been 40 days. It could have been 60 yes. days. But they persevered and they prayed constantly until that power came out. Peter Wagner, in his commentary on the book of Acts, and I love Peter Wagner, late Peter Wagner was my mentor mm. and my apostle. He said it was probably the most extraordinary prayer meeting in the history of the church mm. in the upper room because they're worshiping, they're praying for 10 days. And his theory is that 500 started out because Jesus appeared to 500. Interesting. But only 120. So what happened to 380? Because over time, you know, it's hard to persevere in prayer. Right. You know, 24-hour right. prayer, what Mike has done is, uh, Mike Bickle with the International House of Prayer is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. What Lou Engel did in Mod Auditorium from 1996 to 1999, three years, was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And what was really extraordinary, whereas Mike has people who raise support to pray full-time, we had just volunteers. We just had moms yeah. who had to take care of their kids. We had people who had to work. So they would take a prayer shift from like 3 to 6 and go to work at 7 in the morning. They were volunteers. And we had 80% time filled. And I believe that's the reason why God allowed us to take the prayer to another extraordinary level 
through the call, right. stadium events. And Lou was the founder, but I was the uh, president and administrator of that from 2000, 2003. But so extraordinary prayer. Jonathan Edwards said, if you want to see revival, he was a leader of the Great Awakening in America. There has to be extraordinary prayer. Yeah. The third is radical obedience. And we had touched on this because Jesus commanded 500 to wait until they're endued with power from on high. Now, I understand they weren't from Jerusalem. Right. They were from Galilee. They had business. They had found it and take care of. But 120 were radical. They, they did wait. Yeah. And there's a verse I love in Acts 5, verse 32. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. You know mm. what? Obedience mm. is nothing but a fresh consecration. When you consecrate yourself to God, it's like the Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord look throughout the whole right. earth that He may show Himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are completely His. That's how I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Mm. But I was, um, this is back in 1974, and our worship songs were like day by day, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly day by day from the gospel musical. But I was really praying that. I was saying, God, I want to see you more clearly. I want to love you with yeah. all my heart. I want to follow you more nearly day by day. The moment I began to pray that, the power of God hits me in my whole body. I'm standing singing begins to vibrate. My leg gets electrocuted and I feel this power surging. I thought my legs had fallen asleep while mm. I was standing. It goes up to my head, down my hands, and I could not even close my hand to make a fist Oof. because I'm experimenting. I said, what is going on? At the same time, I'm weeping because of the love of Jesus yeah. is all over me. And I'm wailing. I said, what is going on? And it was a, a week later, uh, someone was, who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, you got baptized with power. That's awesome. <laughs> Have you spoken tongues? I said, no. And they said, let's pray. And immediately I started speaking tongues. Wow. But it was consecration. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love the quote from um, D.L. Moody was in England, and he met another evangelist who was a former world champion boxer. But he said to D.L. Moody, the world has yet to see what God would do through, for, by, with a person who's totally consecrated to God. And D.L. Moody said, I'll be that man. And he became one of the greatest revivalists wow. in the history of the church. He led two million people to the Lord Ooh. after that. I want to make sure our audience caught that. Hey, are you willing to be one of those consecrated ones, one of those set apart ones? Did you hear what Chase said about how there is a theory, and I'd not heard this before until you shared it from Dr. Peter Wagner, that 500 start out or were invited to the prayer meeting, 120 stayed, 120 were radically obedient. Do you want to be one of those 120? All you have to do is say yes to God, and he'll come upon you in power just like he did Che. You may feel it like Che did. You may not. But God is looking for someone just like you to be used radically and powerfully in this hour to shift things in our nation. And if you're watching from outside of the U.S., he wants to use you to shift things in your nation. Che, I... I, I one other thing I want to bounce off of you before I have you pray for the audience. Those three keys are fantastic. One thing, I just finished reading a book about the, the Jesus Revolution. Mm -hmm. And that was way before my time as a Christian. But I read a lot about Lonnie Frisbee, who we all know was the hippie power evangelist, right. miracle signs, wonders, brought all the hippies in. He found it very easy to connect with the hippies and have a heart for the hippies because he's what he was one. Right. But what really touched my heart in this book that I read called The Jesus Revolution was Chuck and Kay Smith. Right. How Kay Smith, who was a you know well-to-do middle upper middle class pastor's wife, her heart broke for the hippies. She started interceding for them, started crying out for them. She saw that they were shipwrecked after the mandate of the 60s failed miserably and they right. were left bereft. But even as she started crying out to God for the hippies, her husband, Chuck Smith, was this pastor. He's like, that's great. You know, you do that. But when they started coming into his church, he needed to have a heart shift. Yes, And absolutely. God challenged him. If I recall correctly, the phrase God used was, are you willing to love those who are different than you? And he said yes and let God do a deep work in his heart and was pivotal part of this great move of God in the 1970s in our nation when our nation looked a lot like it does now with yeah. the social unrest, the political unrest, the division, the anger. How important is it in revival history 
of our willingness to partner with God's heart for the world, for our nation, but especially for those who are different than us, those Amen. politicians that are working against what right. we see. We don't stand for their agenda, but are we willing to fight for them in the spirit, right. for the people who have participated in Antifa? Are right. we willing to fight for them in the spirit? Historically, as you've looked at so many revivals, right. How, how important is that connecting to God's heart aspect of it? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, this, again, the principle was the darkest time before the light of revival. We're seeing the same thing. It was a dark time in the 60s, the radical 60s. We have Dr. King uh, assassinated in 68. We had Kennedy assassinated in 63. We had uh, the uh, riots. Uh, I grew up during that turbulent time, and the war in Vietnam was going on. Mm -hmm. Four were shot in Kent State, Ohio, protests against the war. Just imagine if the military killed or the police killed four students protesting, what the news that would be. Right. And, uh, and so the anniversary of that is called May Day. So every May Day, we would have a concert with some top rock band mm. that would draw thousands into Washington, D.C. Then after the concert, we're, we rioted. Mm. That was the MO. That's how mm. turbulent it was back in those days, and I was part of that in 1972, but, but I got saved in 73. I would have continued, wow. but by God's grace, I came out of it. So I remember that, okay. how dangerous. 1,500 bombs went off in the 60s in different cities. It was extremely violent. And yet, in the midst of this, Chuck Smith welcomes Lonnie Frisbee and brings about the greatest revival among young people. 20 million young people wow. got saved from 1967 to 1977. And so we're talking about a deep darkness and yet the light of revival breaks right. out. And I think we have to have that kind of heart for, for souls. We have to have passion that, you know, I was one of the hippies, you know. And, um, and here's some, something that happened with Chuck. Another story I heard is that his elders complained because when the hippies started to come inside his four square church building, mm -hmm. they were all bare feet mm -hmm. and they were messing up the carpet. And they were complaining and said, you got to tell them to wear shoes. And, he says, what do you want, the people or clean carpet? And they said, we want clean carpet. They said, well, rip out the carpet. I want the people. Right and so he was so radical. He was willing to welcome and give up the comfort of a nice looking carpet yeah. uh, to welcome the hippies in. And so there has to be a real tangible demonstration of love and acceptance towards the loss. And I do believe the harvest is ripe. Yes. You know, I, um, I've been seeing these, the beginning of it with uh, Let Us Worship. For those who don't know, Sean Foyd and Jay Koopman, they've been going around doing open-air worship services. Thousands of young people have given their hearts to the Lord. Amazing. They've been to 200 cities plus now and counting, and hundreds of thousands have showed up, and they estimate minimum of 50,000 have given their hearts to Jesus wow. Christ. So the harvest is starting to come in, and it's with young people. If you take a YouTube video yeah. of who's showing up, it's teenagers. It's not our generation. It's young kids. And then I see Mara Marilla holding these 10 evangelist meetings, and the harvest is coming in. And again, I'm so encouraged by that. But it's an attitude we have to have. And one of the things I've always said, don't expect an unbeliever to act like a believer until they become a believer. Yeah. So we raise these expectations. What do you expect from a gay person? What do you expect from someone who is not saved right. and they're into witchcraft? Right. Right. You know, I mean, it's like they're not saved. Right. You know, what we were doing before we got saved is what they're doing. And so we have to have the eyes of Jesus with compassion. And I, by the way, I believe the signs and wonders supernatural break out when we move in compassion. Amen, I agree. And we see how Jesus was moved with compassion. And that's why we don't see a lot of great power because there's not a lot of compassion in the church. I hate to say that, no, but I think right. as we move into and shift into that kind of compassion uh, that Jesus had, that mercy he had, we will see greater power than we've ever seen in the days ahead. Several years ago, the Lord spoke to me and he said, the coming move of God that will bring in the great harvest will be marked by his personality. We've had moves of power. We've had moves of his presence. This move will be filled with his power and presence, but he said it will be marked by his personality. And I and think what does that, that love look like? I mean, that's, that's, oh. That love, that, love, that compassion, that, that willingness to listen, that, that, that bringing the personality of God, which will then draw right. people, just like the woman at the well. Yeah. She was drawn into that encounter. She didn't want it, 
but she came and encountered the male, the Jew, the rabbi, who is the exact opposite of what she wanted to run into at the well as the town harlot. But because Jesus obviously was the personality of God, it opened the door for the prophetic. It opened the door for salvation. It opened the door for her to become a great rabbi. You should write a book on that if you haven't. <laughs> That's really good stuff. Well, I want to encourage you. It's not too far gone. It's not too dark. We just need a move of God. Remember this, when this whole world was given over to darkness and Satan actually had the keys to this realm, Jesus didn't sit in heaven and say, eh, it's too far gone, it's too dark. He stepped down and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And now Jesus is asking you, will you let him empower you to do for him what is deeply on his heart, to be a part of moving with him for what is about to break out and see this nation turn back to God. Che, just before we leave, I'd like you to look into your camera and in your apostolic authority, release and empower all the viewers to go out into their mandates of influence Amen. and be part of what's yeah. coming. Well, every gospel ends with a great commission. The gospel of John, Jesus appears and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Mm -hmm. And Luke 24, the forgiveness and repentance must be preached to all nations. We see in Acts 1, 8, beginning of Acts, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You should be my witness. Matthew 28, disciple all nations. And these signs will follow Mark chapter 16. Those who believe in my name, they'll cast out demons. They shall lay their hands on the sick. They will recover. And so I want to impart the Great Commission because this is something that's not the great suggestion. This is something that God mandated. He gave us two mandates, to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but then to disciple nations. So, Father, I pray this apostolic mandate, because the word apostolic means sent out once, and I pray that everyone watching will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that you would increase the authority or the revelation of the authority that they have, because your word says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of nation. And Lord, I send them out in the power of the Holy Spirit into their world, primarily with your friends and relatives, because 80% of those who get saved is family members and friends that you have. So I pray this in Jesus' mighty name, in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Amen and amen. Amen. Che, your new book is Turning Our Nation Back to God Through Historic Revival. Let the audience know where they can get it they and then where on, they can hear more yeah, from you Amazon. as well. Amazon.com uh, or you could go to my website, cheon.org. It's really simple. Thank God my mom gave me a short name, C-H-E-A-H-N.org. And you could order it there as well. Dr. Che, thank you thank so you much so for much, being with Robert, us. Thank you. And thank you for being with us for this episode of Heroes Arise. We'll see you back here next week for another one. Ready for more? Go to roberthotchkin.com for more teachings, more resources, and more information about Robert Hodgkin Ministries and men on the front lines.